The Arctic can be deadly. It's proven that for centuries. Its barren lands unforgiving. Its frigid waters can kill in seconds, and they have. From Inuit hunters to European explorers to present day scientists, death in the Arctic has been and still is a fact of life. The latest story of northern tragedy started here in Resolute, high in Canada's Arctic, early this month. The Canadian Coast Guard vessel Amundsen was central to the story. It's one of several Coast Guard icebreakers I've been on, toured its facilities, met its crew, flown in its helicopter. This time, when it left Resolute for points west, it seemed like a routine trip, but nothing in the Arctic is routine. Weather can change in a matter of moments. Problems can arise without warning. And very quickly, things can get desperate, with rescuers hours, sometimes days away. Time those with problems don't have. Southern Canadians know very little about what goes on in their Arctic. The constant research into climate and ice, conditions that are rapidly changing the north, and someday, many are sure, will change the south as well. These men and women are the heroes of that rarely discussed research. And every day, their work, whether it's on ships like the Amundsen or field studies out on the ice, puts their lives on the line. On September the 9th, just days into the voyage, death came calling once again to Canada's Arctic. It happened during what turned out to be the final flight of the Amundsen's helicopter, an MBB-105. Daniel Dubé was in the pilot's seat, 30 years of flight experience behind him, and due to retire in the next year or so. With him, Amundsen's captain, Marc Thibault, wanting to check out the ice conditions on his vessel's route through the Northwest Passage. And Klaus Hawkheim, one of the country's top climate research scientists, anxious to test the newly forming ice close up. Within hours, all three men would be freezing to death in the frigid waters of McClure Strait, their helicopter lying on the sea floor 450 meters below the surface. What happened and why? Until the chopper is inspected, the full story won't be known. But some things are known now, and tonight, for the first time, CBC News can tell them. As the chopper headed out, the weather, for the Arctic anyway, was pretty good. Winds were calm. The sea, mostly still open from ice, was relatively flat, no swells. The sky was overcast. Water temperature about zero the air about minus five. Those conditions may sound good to us, but for pilots, there's a warning to consider when overcast skies are mixed with flat seas. That's where the pilot has to know what he's doing. And um, when we get away with it, we, uh, we thank our lucky stars. And I think every pilot that I know that has flown in these conditions have got, has got caught in it. And uh, some, of them, some of them make it, some of them don't. Leonard Shorkey has flown in the Arctic for more than 30 years. Veteran chopper pilots like him know well the dangers of calm waters and sky, a deadly combination they call glassy water. Glassy is just like a mirror, so it reflects the sky. And there's no horizon because you can't see it. You have no visual clues. You don't know how high off you are from the, the water or the, or the sky except by your instruments and you can't afford to take your eyes off the instruments because if you do that you can go into a vertigo situation and if you go into a vertigo situation you can lose control of the aircraft and that's one of the bad things about glassy water it's the worst thing about glassy water nobody wants to be in it or get caught by it About three miles from the Amundsen, the chopper descended almost to water level and headed for some ice patches. Hawkheim wanted to do ice probes, checking everything from thickness to age. It's a relatively common operation, but common doesn't mean without danger. The pilot hovers just above the surface, literally just a few meters. 
The Amundsen's chopper did probes for quite some time as Hawkeye gathered a lot of data. There was no indication anything was wrong. In fact, when the work was complete, about eight in the evening, Dubé radioed the Amundsen. The aircraft was inbound, the pilot said, indicating they'd be back on the ship's deck within 10 minutes. There was still lots of daylight left. But 10 minutes passed and no MBB-105. When the chopper didn't respond to repeated radio calls, the Amundsen went into rescue mode, but the waters had begun to clog with ice and breaking through the three miles took longer than expected, somewhere between 40 minutes and an hour to get to the scene. When they finally arrived in the search area, they quickly found the three men in the water, dead from hypothermia. The only other things evident, small pieces of debris and a first aid kit, unopened, floating on the surface. The death of scientist Hawkheim meant the loss of a good friend for David Barber, he too a veteran of working in the Arctic. Sadly, he recognizes the crew was alive for only a brief time in that icy water. The water is far too cold and you'd become, you know, you'd go through all the stages of hypothermia very rapidly uh, with uh, death following uh, shortly thereafter because your, your internal organs all shut down. Only Dubé was wearing a full Arctic immersion suit. It's designed to keep people alive in icy waters, but only if it's fully sealed. Dubé's wasn't. Pilots often fly with them slightly unzippered because of how hot they get. And that's how Dubé was found. Both Captain Thibault and scientist Hawkheim did have special suits on, but not ones that would provide full protection against the icy waters. It's Coast Guard policy that life jackets must always be worn on chopper flights over water. But the searchers were puzzled. Two of the men were found without life jackets, and the third did have one on, but it wasn't properly inflated. What happened in those final seconds? The flight suit and life jacket facts suggest whatever it was, it must have happened very quickly. And there's more. Pictures from the sea floor show the chopper's front section heavily damaged and the tail broken off. There's said to be a debris field for about a thousand feet around the chopper. The MBB-105 had equipment that could have kept the aircraft afloat for hours, but while the pictures have shown investigators a switch to deploy pop-up floats was activated, the floats weren't. Had the impact damage destroyed that frantic last minute hope? The aircraft had an onboard life raft ready for emergencies. There's no evidence it was used. And finally, pilot Dubé either had no time or was unable to radio one last distress call. Air crash investigators will eventually determine why the chopper went down but that could take a year or more and it won't be easy. This model helicopter does not carry black boxes, the devices that monitor and record all aircraft operations. However, it did carry a fixed camera to record the ice probe operation. It's not clear whether it was recording at the time things went so terribly wrong. If it was, its pictures could offer some firm answers. Here are three possible scenarios. Total engine or mechanical failure, driving the chopper immediately and violently into the sea. No time to deploy any emergency procedures. Icing, after all that hovering close to frigid waters. Not likely though, as Dubé would have almost certainly noticed any early ice buildup on the glass bubble in front of him. The weather, that potentially dangerous and deceptive combination of overcast skies and flat seas basically being fooled into thinking you're higher than you are. Even the most experienced pilots say it's happened to them and only last second maneuvering saved them. All three men somehow got out before the crushed chopper sank, but then the cold icy waters quickly began their death grip. Whether the men in their desperate last moments ever saw the Amundsen trying to reach them, we'll never know. Klaus Hawkheim, Mark Thibault, Daniel Dubé, 
They were remembered by friends and relatives over the past few days. Three men who loved the North, faced its challenges, and died trying to make our world better. Science needs to, to first of all understand what's going on because of our changing climate, but then it needs to inform the public and inform politicians so that they can make you know, reasonable and meaningful policy decisions about how we adjust to the, the very dramatic changes that are going on. The work that we do is important to our society and it's not something that is, is easily managed and it is risky, it does have risks associated with it, but the risks of not doing something are even larger. From Henry Hudson to John Franklin to Marty Bergman to those on board the Amundsen chopper, the Arctic has claimed some of the best